some of you have heard my testimony a little bit, but I was a pretty rambunctious kid. I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, I got to see a jail cell at the age of 13. Uh, but I was in fourth grade, and I got in trouble, and I, I basically didn't want to go on a field trip. I showed up to school, and they were going to do what we call a walking field trip. I grew up in the mountains, and so we had, we lived right next to the National Forest. The school was right next to the National Forest. And so it's going to be one of those trips where they take the whole school, and you, you, you were supposed to know about it, and you pack your lunch, and you, and you go out into the woods, and you learn about trees and roads and different plant life and the history of the mountain and all that kind of stuff. And you'd think that kids would enjoy such a thing, but I got there and, and forgot that it was happening and didn't have the right information. I hadn't brought my own lunch, and uh, I decided I'll, I won't miss anything if I just shoot out of school and walk on home. And so I started to walk on home, and then I hear this voice, Hey! You! You know, kid! <laughs> and it was the principal. And uh, so I went to him, and I was like, ah, I didn't realize we were having a field trip. I just uh, decided I'd go on home. And he goes, well, no, no, you, you know, you can go. And I said, well, I didn't even pack a lunch. You know, I'm trying to draw straws here to get out of my situation. He says, oh, I'll, I'll, come on. I'll, I'll. And, and he brought me into the cafeteria, and he starts packing a lunch for me, the principal does. Well, and a beautiful lunch, by the way. And while he's got his back turned, I run out of the, <laughs> I ran out of the uh, auditorium. And uh, he's like, wait! <laughs> and I hop up six foot fence, and I ran home, and then I get home just in time uh, to hear the answering machine go off. And you guys have to explain this because there's a generation in here that doesn't know what an answering machine is quite. So what happens is your phone rings in your house and there's this box next to it. And it has, a, it has this thing we call a cassette tape. It had this little thing that went around in circles. It would give this message. And, and you get to hear it right there. You don't have to pick up your phone or anything. And I'm there with my dad and I've explained to my dad what I've done. And he hasn't processed it all. And there's Dr. Wainer. Dr. Al Wainer was the principal's name. Hi, Mr. Fisher. This is Dr. Al Wainer with Meadow, uh, I think it was called Meadow Park Elementary or something like that. Meadow, I can't even remember my elementary school name. Meadow uh, Lane Elementary School. And uh, your son uh, opted to ditch school today. I tried to catch him, you know, and, and he stood there explaining it all to my dad, and I was busted. So uh, my mom brought me into the office the next day, and uh, I'm sitting with my mom, me, and Dr. Wainer, and Dr. Wainer is this very kind, you can tell already from the story, he's a very kind man, and he says, I'm willing to forgive everything that happened yesterday if Jeff will simply apologize, and my mouth was as tight as could be, <laughs> and I looked at my mom, and she gave me the look of death. <laughs> Whatever he does to you won't compare what I'm going to do to you. But I'm so stubborn. And so in the end, it, it worked out that I had to come to school and move rocks. So the school was a new school, and we were clearing a, a uh, soccer field. And so for five days on recess, instead of recess, I, I moved rocks from the field to the sides of the field. Fourth grade <laughs> uh, for for five straight days on recess, and so that was my lesson. So I don't think that I really learned my lesson then, like Tommy talked about. You learn your lesson when you move the rocks, but it was the beginning of God moving the rocks in my heart. And later, I had more experiences with that principal and learned that he was a Christian. Uh, it was a public school, but later they transferred him. When I transferred to uh, high school, eventually. He became the high school principal. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I decided to, at, in high school, I wanted to get out so bad, I decided to take night classes. They had college <coughs> night classes offered. And one was New Testament introduction. In college, regular, secular college, New Testament introduction. Um, and I decided I would take it. And so it was nighttime. And that would count towards credits towards my high school and help you to get out of high school a year early. So in the end, I, I ended up getting out of high school early by going in, into night college classes. But who would you know was the teacher for the New Testament class 
at the college. It was Dr. Al Wainer. And I learned that Dr. Al Wainer was a doctor in theology. And boy, he had a time teaching me in that class, and I soaked it up. It was the beginning of the workings of the Lord in my life. And uh, what a marvelous man. So he died, and life went on, and the journey went on. And one of the coolest things, I was in a thrift store. Came home to visit mom and dad, you know, for being gone. And I always go to the books. When I'm in the thrift stores, I go to the book section. And I look at what books there are. Here's an old Bible there. And I pulled it out. And it wasn't a Bible I didn't have, but I opened it up, and it was Al Wainer's Bible. Yeah. And so to this day, I saw his Bible, and I'm like, yeah. yeah. So he moves the rocks way back then that helped uh, move some rocks later in my life. So just wanted to share that story because. It's funny, when somebody gives a scripture or gives a story or communion or whatever, the mind works, the Lord works, and brings memories to your heart about your life and your experience. Um, I'm so grateful for Jesus today. I, when I think of my life and what it could have been and who I could have been and what would have happened for me, uh, it all changed because of Jesus. I mean, I was the kid that nobody in school thought would have mounted anything good. I think prison, suicide, or death was what was people's predictions for my life. And uh, God got a hold of that and changed it. And he's still working and changing lives today. You know, sometimes we think our life is a mess. Sometimes we've made some horrible decisions. Sometimes we've done things that we regret. And the truth is that uh, God's not done with the business of giving you a new chance, making new beginnings. He calls it being born again. God's not done with, with the opportunity to let you live a new life, a forgiven life. You know, a lot of times men and, and, and friends and family won't forgive us. And I, that's a shame. I wish they would. I wish they could find grace in their hearts to forgive us for some of the things that we've done. But God can forgive us. Sometimes we won't find the forgiveness for people that we want. But God is so gracious. He's so kind so good that he indeed continues to forgive us. So I want to look at a scripture in Revelation, and then we'll be looking at chapter 4 of Luke today, and that'll be the main uh, core of the message. And here in Revelation, as Mike Tate read, and I'm going to read it again, I'm going to start at verse 1 actually, I don't know why I didn't put verse 1 for the reading, but here we are in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne encircled by the 24 living creatures and the elders. You know, this is a vision of, of John, the apostle. He's in captivity on the island of Patmos, is what we understand from history. He's the last probably living apostle, and all the others have been killed and murdered for their faith. And uh, God has caught him up in this vision, a revelation that Jesus wants to share with him. And in the first part of the chapter, we get kind of the scope of what's happening. And then in the second chapter and the third chapter of Revelation, and even part of the, uh, uh, well, basically the second and third, we get a kind of a personalized message to seven churches. And, and then the fourth chapter, we kind of get the setting. And in five, he is there in this vision, and he sees that the one on the throne, God is on the throne, and he has this scroll in his hand with these seven seals. And, and nobody can open it because nobody's worthy. And for the Jewish mind, the Jewish reader, they understand this, this, is, this is the scroll of judgment. 
This is that scroll that reveals God's wrath, His anger. This morning in, in uh, Bible study, we so fittingly talked about uh, reverence and discipline and the, and the degree of fear one should have and that kind of thing. And I was thinking, you know, that uh, all my heroes in the movies are, it's like Chuck Norris. And it's those guys that um, they, they, they patiently wait for you to be stupid and rebellious. <coughs> And they wait some more for you to do more foolish things. And they kind of maybe give you a little warning and they don't do anything. They, they, they're patiently waiting some more for you to kind of finally wake up that you're doing the wrong thing. And then you don't do the right thing anymore. And so, pop! But they take care of business. And the discipline kicks in. And it seems like, I always like movies like that, where they, 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 the patience is extended to the people that are the, the, the bad people for a period of time. Until patience runs out, and then it's time to give you discipline. And I was like the heroes that even didn't finish that. It wasn't like that's the end of the story. They disciplined the guy, and then they're kind of like, okay, now you understand? It wasn't like the end of the story. It's like even in their discipline, there's grace. And I think this is kind of how God is. God has given us patience. He, it says we should learn repentance by his kindness. The kindness of God should bring the fruit of repentance in our life. When we know we've done something wrong, or we've sinned, or we've transgressed, we've done something that we know is not right, He gives us a period of time, usually, to, to repent. He, he gets that quiet wounding of the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and say, you should probably go apologize about that. Or you should correct that. Or you should return that. Or you should not do that. And then if we continue to resist that, then the pressure goes up and he disciplines those he loves. But even in his discipline, it's not condemnation. In his discipline, it's not judgment. His discipline is still trying to woo you back to doing what is the right thing. And so God has done this with all of mankind. And the curious thing here in this passage is that when... They're wondering who's going to open the scroll. And if you were to read on in Revelation and we were to study the seals and which one, everything happens during the, the breaking of the seals. And we're not doing that today. We're not doing the prophetic uh, unraveling of the book of Revelation today. Maybe that would be fun to do. But it, it, it's terrifying. Half of the population of the earth dies by the time you reach the last seal. Half of every living person on the earth dies before God's done with his wrath. And so when they're looking for who is worthy to break these seals open, they say the one who is worthy is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So when we hear lion of the tribe of Judah, it would spin the biblical mind back to Genesis chapter 49 into a prophecy of a father who was explaining to all his sons what their future would hold. And to his son Judah, he says, in your hand shall be the scepter, and, and you shall be a ruler. And so the Jewish scholars, the Jewish writers, the prophets, the people of the Bible, they always understood that when the Messiah finally came, he would come as a descendant from the tribe of Judah. And so it's a common theme within the Bible to speak of the, the lion, the tribe of Judah, this, you know, even... Even they carried it down into the son of David, because David was part of that, that genealogical line. But when John, who's caught up in this vision, looks up, when they announce that the lion of the tribe of Judah is the one who can open this scroll of wrath, he looks up, and he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb. And so it's kind of a strange passage, you know, for, for the Jewish mind. They're kind of like, what do you mean you see a lamb? And John says, I don't just see a lamb. I, I see a lamb that looks as if it's already been killed. And you and I know from our experiences being Christians that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Even when he stepped out into his ministry for the very early days and he came in the presence of John the Baptist... John looks up and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And who remembers why would Jesus be referred to as the Lamb? 
What's significant about a lamb? Sacrifice. The sacrifice. And a particular one. One going way back to when the, when the Jews were captives in, in Egypt. And there was a time when he wanted to rescue them. But in order to pull them out, he needed to teach Pharaoh a lesson. And so he sent his death angel in to destroy the firstborn child of every family. But he told his people, he said, if you would sacrifice a lamb and splash the blood over the doorpost, I'll protect you. And you'll be covered by the blood of the lamb. I'll keep you from death. I'll, I'll rescue you from slavery. You won't see the same punishment as the Egyptians if you cover your house with the blood of the lamb. And so all this imagery comes to John. And, and when, when a, when a, a well-versed Jewish person is reading this type of passage, all these pictures come to their mind. Just like pictures were coming to my mind when I thought about carrying rocks uh, when Tommy brought up the rock story. And so the picture here is basically, and we're going to move on from this to go to Luke 4, but the picture here is that, and I've said this in many messages to you guys, and I'm drilling it in because I want the Bible to unfold to you in a richer way. But the prophets missed there was going to be two comings. They completely missed it. They didn't realize the Messiah would come and die, and then the Messiah would come and judge. They combined the two visits. And so even though they saw those suffering verses, a lot of times they, they applied them to the nation. And when they saw the judgment verses, they thought, well, this is also when the Messiah comes to judge and, and establish us and put us back in our rightful place. But that wasn't the way Jesus had planned it. The way God had planned it all along is that he would come, he would suffer, he would pay the price of sin. <clears throat> he would go away. There would be a time. And then he would come back and he would judge. And so we're waiting for another coming. We're still waiting. And that coming is the Lord returning to judge. You know, even this morning, we read a verse that said, many scoffers will come and say, well, where is this coming? People have been talking about the coming of the Lord for hundreds of years. I mean, ever since our fathers died, you've been talking about the coming of the Lord. And Peter says, scoffers will come. And if we've ever entered an age when people have ceased to believe that Jesus is We are ripe and ready for cataclysmic change in this world. We're ready to see the seals begin to bust open and judgment begin, begin to pour on. And it's a terrible, horrible time. The prophet Amos says, Woe unto you that long for the coming of the Lord. For you don't understand that it is a day of vengeance and a day of destruction. <clears throat> but we've come to a point it's been so long I hardly believe it. But all that patience, why has God been so patient? The Bible says in Peter, he's been that patient because he wants to give you opportunity to repent. It's so much better to repent by saying I'm sorry and dealing with it than it is to fall under the discipline of God and then find your repentance. But even in the book of Revelation, you will find is a wrath of God and the pouring out of the vials and the pouring out of the break of the seals of this scroll that describes the punishment of the earth. That men, it says, will crawl in the caves and pray that the mountains and the rocks will fall on them. Rather than repent, they would wish to die. And that's how stubborn we can become sometimes in locking our mouths shut <laughs> instead of giving the repentance that God would have us to do. But I want to talk a little bit more about Jesus and his ministry and the day that we are in because he hasn't returned yet and his grace is still there for us. So in Luke chapter 4, that's where we'll spend the rest of our time starting in verse 14. And I want to talk about how Jesus went from being a hero to a heretic in just a few hours. In just a few hours, Jesus went from hero to heretic. From hero, we appreciate what you had to say, to I'm going to take you and throw you off a cliff. 
So in first, uh, verse 14 of Luke chapter, 14, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 14. So Jesus has been tempted in the wilderness. He's begun his ministry. He's beginning to preach. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's beginning to do miracles. Pe people are, he started to get a reputation. But he grew up, you know, in Nazareth. And Jesus returned to Galilee. That's kind of the area where Nazareth is, up in the north. In the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So, I mean, when Jesus taught, people were like, wow. And one passage of Scripture says, he taught, he didn't teach like the scribes and the Pharisees. He taught as someone with authority. He taught as someone who knew what he was talking about. Wow, they never had teaching like this before. And not only so, if Jesus is teaching about healing or he's teaching about the Sabbath or he's teaching about any type of thing, it seems like he always performs a miracle to back up what he just said. It's amazing, this guy. You should go hear him. He's incredible. Come on to the synagogue. Come hear this Jesus guy. He's fascinating. And he's so forgiving. He gives grace to the craziest of people. Do you remember that one tax collector we all hated? He actually has him following him. Oh, do you remember that prostitute that so and so slept with that everybody knew about? Uh, he said her sins were forgiven. This guy changed the world. He was a different kind of teacher. In verse 16 it says, He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. That's often how Jesus did it. He just hit him up on Saturday, got most of the town gathered together, and go into the synagogue. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll. Gave it back to the attendant. And sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Wow! I mean, he just walked in ripped open Isaiah, read this powerful verse about being set free, about being released, about finding freedom. And they're, they're, some of them are probably thinking about Rome. They're probably thinking, I'm going to be free from Rome. I'm going to be free from this bondage of this government, of this oppression, of this time, of this culture, of this place and time. Finally, the Messiah has come. But then wait, somebody says, wait a second. Isn't this Joseph's son? And that wasn't a, wow, this is Joseph's son. This, that, that wasn't a pride statement. That was a, wait a second, we need to question everything that Jesus guy just said. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you, well, let me pause on that. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. Why? Why not? Because with familiarity, there's a lack of respect. Why? Why does familiarity cause you to disrespect somebody? Because you've seen their weaknesses. Because you've seen their weaknesses. Well, did they see any weaknesses in Jesus? What weaknesses did they see in Jesus? Maybe they thought they had equality with him since they grew up with him. Played with him on the playground. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe there's something to do with Joseph here. Lack of faith. Yeah. Anything good comes from this town. Exactly. 
What Later, is, yeah, they even condemned their own town. How could anything good come out of Nazareth? His birth was questionable. His birth was questionable. <laughs> Mary says she was born of the Holy Spirit of the, of the Virgin. <laughs> even to this day, Jews, some writers believe that Mary was impregnated by a Roman. And that's what they try to teach to discourage people. So here was Jesus. And he didn't have the ability to flatter his own people because all they could see is his history. You know, God changes our lives. He gives us the opportunity to be born again. But a lot of times, we have zero impact on the people we love the most. Because all they can see is who you were. <laughs> I remember who you were. I remember what you did. I remember what you said and how you behaved. And now you're going to tell me all this good juicy stuff about Jesus? Who do you think you are? Where did you come from? I know where you came from. And now you're going to be self-righteous? And it wasn't even that Jesus was trying to be self-righteous. He was actually trying to help people. But they couldn't hear him because all they could see is his past. And we believe his past was impeccable. But maybe Joseph's wasn't. Maybe his family there wasn't. Maybe Nazareth wasn't. Maybe his block. Maybe his street. Maybe his reputation. I don't know. But because they were familiar with him, they weren't interested in what he had to say. And now he wants to address that in verse 25. He says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to the widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Now, for us, you might go, what, what kind of answer is that? What, what does that even mean? But you understand, Jesus' audience they didn't have television, they weren't playing Terraria, sorry, they weren't <laughs> playing all these video games. They, their minds were directed on what they had accessible to them. Okay, And so, the common person was much more biblically literate than many of us are today. So when you brought up a Bible story, especially he's speaking to a synagogue audience, they know what the details are of that story. But we don't. And, and we should. But we don't. We've, we've come to love Jesus. We've come to take his salvation. We've come to run with it. But many of us are never going to know the scriptures as well as we could or should. But these people did. So they won't need this explanation that I'm going to give. Okay. How would this passage, and I, I don't say that to insult you. It's not to insult you. It's to spur you on to hunger for a deeper understanding of the word of God. Uh, You'll find me going into the Old Testament more than most of you have had to experience. Because I think the Old Testament is rich. I think it's a gold mine. I think it'll drive you closer to God than you ever thought you could get. I think you'll find truths and revelations and things that will impact your heart that will amaze you. That you'll chew on and you'll go, man, that's the best meal I've had in years. So don't neglect your Old Testament. It is amazing. So here he goes and he says... You know, this situation is kind of like the situation Elijah had. <laughs> you know, Elijah lived in a time with King Ahab, and he was wicked. I mean, Ahab and Jezebel, they were incredibly wicked. They didn't even want to worship God anymore. They started worshiping me. And God had sent his prophet Elijah into the land, and, 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 and he had prophesied and told them to repent and try to get them to change. And, and at one point, God said, Elijah, just pray that it won't rain, and it won't rain anymore. Because this is an agricultural society that depends on agricultural, and if it depends on rain, it needs rain, and he prays that it won't rain, and it won't rain, and it doesn't rain for three and a half years. Can you imagine what would happen to Rocky and Tammy if we had no moisture for three and a half years? Every farm would go out of business. 
The cows would have to be moved to another state. It would be devastating. Well, that's the way the whole country operated there. And so it was devastating them. And they knew because this prophet had done it. Uh, he had made the prayer. He had proclaimed it. It, it was a public thing. And they wanted him dead or alive. They were, they were on a search to get this guy. And he himself is suffering from the fact there is no water. And so God tells him to go to this widow. And it says this widow lives in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Well, if there's anything we know about Zarephath of Sidon, is it's not a Jewish city. Okay? And the other thing is, it's north of Nazareth. It's an oppressive city to the Nazarenes. And so Elijah's called to go up there, and he meets this woman. He's getting into the gate of the city, and he sees this woman gathering sticks. And he says, woman, give me some water. And she goes to get him water. And by the way, get me some bread and, and make me a cake. And she's like, I've got just a smidge of oil in this cruise. And I've got just a, a little bit of flour, just enough to make enough for me and my son. And I have these two sticks. I was going to light the fire, make the cake, and then we were going to die. He's like, serve me first and then God will take care of the rest. <laughs> Ooh, that's a challenging story right there. We can do a whole sermon on it. But we're not. We're just trying to figure out why did Jesus use this as an illustration to the Nazarene, to, to the uh, people of Nazareth. I, I do want to put in there, too, there's a, there's a mystery hit. If we would have had potluck, we did cancel our potluck this week. Uh, usually at uh, potluck Fridays, when we have them, I always grab something that I'm going to do in the sermon and, and expand upon it. And we were going to talk about the two sticks. Uh, in Ezekiel, it talks about these broken, you know, these two sticks that God puts together. One is Judah and one is Ephraim or Joseph. And it's all about the uniting of, of the Jewish nation when he comes back to be Messiah. That's really deep, and this is just a commercial, so you can get bored and ignore me for a moment. But in that, in that commercial, when you think about Jesus returning, were the tribes divided into 12? Or were they united? United. They were united. Okay, so Israel was united when Jesus returned, when they were under the the Roman thing. So, so the Bible has this kind of uh, prophetic message for us as we dig about when the Lord comes and the timing and all that, and it, and it's woven into this this mystery about two sticks. It tells it a lot of other ways, but this little story talks about a woman still in the commercial here, who who wants to gather wood to cook her bread and her oil to provide for her son. And for some reason, in Hebrew, it says there's two sticks. Some of your versions are going to say that she was gathering a few sticks or a couple of sticks, but the Hebrew is obtrusively bland in, in saying two sticks. And that, that when you're reading the Hebrew, you're like, why two sticks? Like, why two sticks to start a fire with? <coughs> but then when you see the whole picture of the story as a whole, you realize that she is a picture of of God gathering her people back together, and that she has a son who's going to die, and later in the story, if we were to read it in 1 Kings chapter 17, who's going to die, and then he's going to be risen from the dead after Elijah lays on him three times. Does this sound familiar? A gathering of the people, a death of the son, a resurrection after three, uh, all, the, the bread and the oil, and all of this story, I mean, every story in the Old Testament is not just put there for a little history commercial. It's put there to give you prophetic vision of something God's going to do in the future. Jesus is found in almost every chapter of the Bible. His name may not be there, but his life, his vision, his being, his what, is, what he's going to do is there. It must have been fun to be Jesus as a kid, to read the Bible and go, that's me. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Yeah, I'm going to do that too. Huh, that's the symbol of when I'm going to do that. It, it, it just must have been incredible. So, but at this point, what is Jesus trying to tell the people of Nazareth? Ahab's not receptive. Jezebel's not receptive. The whole nation's not receptive. The only people receptive right now is this widow who's not even a Jew. 
God's prophet went and provided the oil and bread for a lifetime and the resurrection of his son for the Gentiles. And they, they feel the dagger. They don't quite see the picture like you may see it. You see it a little better because you're on the backside. But they feel like, hmm, Jesus is basically saying that those people up north are more receptive than we are to God's will. He says it again in case they didn't get it in verse 37. I mean verse 27. He says, and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Next prophet down now. Yet no, not one of them was cleansed. So in the time of Elisha, the prophet that came after Elijah, there were lots of people with leprosy. But there's not a record of a single Jewish person getting healed of leprosy during that period. The only person that gets healed of leprosy is the very force they hated the most, the Syrian army to the north, the commander of the Syrians, comes and says, I have leprosy, I need to be healed. And being a man of respect, he doesn't go to the prophet first. He goes to the king. He says, I've heard that in your land that you can get healed of leprosy. And the king's like, what, are they trying to trap us here? I can't heal of leprosy. And this is the son of, of Ahab. I think his name was Jeroboam. Je Jehoram, Jehoram. And... And then, he, and then Elisha the prophet hears of it and he says, wait, 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 send them to me. And so this guy, the Syrian, comes to him and he says to his servant, he doesn't need greet him. He sends his servant out to, to this commanding officer in the Syrian army. See, see how devoting it is. Like, there's this whole respect thing going on here. The commander of the Syrian army expects to get a ceiling from the king of Israel. He's sidestepped to go to some prophet thing. Meanwhile, the prophet guy doesn't even give him the time of day. He sends out his servant to speak to the commander. What is being worked here in the works is, is God is trying to work on this guy's pride from the beginning. He's trying to work on the idea that he's so prideful that he's not receptive to the word that can heal him. I've been that prideful. I'm not receptive to the very words that can heal me. I could have skipped five days of moving rocks by just saying, I'm sorry. So the commander goes, and the servant gives him the word, and the word is this. Go dip. Baptize. That's a, that's a green word. It means to dip, to immerse. Go dip, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Well, he's from Syria. And, and, and Parbar, these rivers up there are much more lush. They, they, they've got cedar trees that grow up to them. They're beautiful and the waters are clear because, you know, they're clean. The Jordan River is nasty. And you guys are in a drought. And it's, it's not a pleasant place to go dip myself. The prophet sent the servant to tell me to dip myself seven times in that nasty river. There are much better rivers where I came from that I could dip. Pride is still at work here. It's a humble request. Would he have been healed had he dipped himself in his own rivers? Was there magic in the water of Jordan? So why was there healing in the water of Jordan? Obedience. Obedience. Just do what the prophet said. So he marches on down. He eventually does humble out because his servant gets his servant gets him to humble out. He says, "Hey, if I told you to do something crazy, you would have done it. If he told you to slaughter a thousand men and bring back their skin, you would have done it. But he asked you to do this ignoble thing, this ridiculous thing, and you won't do it." And he wakes up and goes, okay, I do want to be healed for my, my, my leprosy. I do want to be healed. I want to be set free. I want to be released. I don't want to be a captive anymore. I will do it. And he dunks himself seven times in the nasty, stinky Jordan River and comes out clean. Mm -hmm. What does Jesus say? He's saying, 
even the Gentile Syrians that you hate in the north are more receptive to the word of God than you are. You, the ones who've been ordained to carry the word from generation to generation, you, the synagogue keepers, you, the ones who kept the Torah, the Tanakh, the prophets, and, and the writings, and you preserved them, and you hand-wrote them, and you built a whole society at Qumran to copy them, and you, you, you the ones that treasure the word, you the ones who seek the scriptures, and you search the scriptures, because in them you think you have salvation, you are not receptive. He tells us all the time, you're just not receptive. If you were receptive, you would do the things that I say. Are they fired up at this point? Are they like, please, Jesus, just tell me what to do. I want to do it now. You convince me, Jesus. That's enough, Jesus. Okay, I got it now. The next verse tells us how they were. Go back to verse 22. All spoke well of them, him, and were amazed at his gracious words. Now slip down to verse 28. All the people of the synagogue were furious with him when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down off the cliff. But he walked, he walked right through them. He walked right through the crowd and went on his way. I don't know if that means he turned invisible or, or what he did. But they wanted to kill him. You know, and this is it. Jesus wants to come to you as a lamb. He wants to come to you as a lamb. He wants his blood to cover your sins and to change your life. But if you won't receive him as a lamb, he will come to you as a lion. Even in his lioness, that's a word I can grab, not meaning a female lion. His lion in this. Even this ferociousness is a lion. I hope you see that there is mercy. Even in his anger, even in his, his directness, even in his having this penned down for us by Luke, that need to be read generation after generation after generation so that we can search the scriptures and find truth. Even in him doing everything he's done, even though some of it may feel harsh, it's because that's how desperately he wants to save your life. You're the one running off the cliff. And first he throws a lamb out for you to get distracted by. Please come to the lamb and save the lamb. It's bleeding, it's hurt. Come to the lamb. Get away from the cliff. But if that doesn't work, he sends a lion. And the lion's climbing up the cliff to try to stop you from falling off the cliff. God's discipline is because he loves you. He's going to be a lion or a lamb for every one of us. I've met the lamb. And he is so tender. He is so gentle. He's so forgiving. He's so willing. He's so ready. He's so loving. He's self-sacrificial. He takes the burden. When it's heavy and it's hard, he says, come to me. I'll carry it for you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, we...